Okay. Here we go, dude. <laughs> the bosses and raids of Ride MMO. Well, hello there. Hi. It seems like people really enjoy it when I talk about things covered in deep layers of copium. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't think we're riding on copium I think so, that Mom. much. So far, I have not made up a single thing. I am simply presenting things that already exist. And okay. as my videos got traction, I started getting some valuable feedback. So before we begin today's video, let's have a look at some of the things you just had to point out. Holy. For those of you who believe we are starting unhealthy hype, it's fine. As long as we all understand that we are we dealing with hypotheticals. Know. And that we will all be bold by the time it comes out. I also got to interview the person who wrote the upcoming massive Ooh. League of Legends novel. Who was confirmed to now be working on the MMO. And he told me that yes, my videos are being passed among the developers. So you can stop tagging them on Twitter now. Also, that novel is insanely good. It's Game of Thrones in League of Legends. I am excited for the potential lore of the MMO. Next, um... Holy, yeah, you're yeah. actually good MMO coming out, chat? With good story? That is rare. That's hard to do. MMOs usually, you know, don't have the strongest... Lore. I'm wearing my slippers out of my own volition. Yes, uh, shamans can shapeshift in this universe, just like druids. And yes, Riot confirmed that Legends of Runeterra, which is the card game based on League of Legends, is a big inspiration when it comes to the world building. In case you're wondering what this is about, all the art I am showing you comes from Legends of Runeterra, a game that secretly acts as a massive archive of art that reveals this universe. Anyway, after covering the world and all the races and classes the lore supports, we can we now dive into them, the potential course. endgame bosses of this MMO. Now I know what you're thinking. This game isn't even in the playtesting phase, how can we talk about the raids? Well, you see, that's because Riot was probably thinking ahead of time. And they started a bit of a meme in the lore community. They gave this universe way too many world-ending threats. The downside of this is that, yeah, there was a time when we didn't know which world-ending threat was the real world-ending threat. I think this is a good thing they have so many choices to choose from. You know how WoW built, World of Warcraft built off of like, the whole Warcraft uh, 1, 2, 3, especially Frozen Throne, Arthur's coming back. I think bringing champions from their own game is going to have a lot of hype. It's cool to see. I love that. So all the like heroes you can play in League, we will see some of them as bosses for sure. 100%. Threat. It was a battle between who's the biggest evil. But the yeah. benefits are obvious. You have a lot of meaningful enemies that you can remove before you start living. And it's like characters we already know, so people will like that. If it's some random bozo, people will not like that, right? Like Jailer. Jailer was kind of random bozo. People hated him. But if you kind of know who the villain is, it's cool. They like that a lot. In your storytelling. And in fact, many of these big storylines are written with all the back doors open. So that in the future, they can utilize them for an event in League of Legends. Or it is stories that were left open purposefully for the MMO. They've been writing this is what video is going to be about. Originally, I, I wanted that. to show you 10 storylines that were left open and which would lead into raids. But if you look at the length of this video, yeah, I cut it down to only seven. So without further ado, let's get yeah. on. Since we are essentially talking about the world of League of Legends, especially if you have seen our last two MMO videos. It goes without saying that this world has material for hundreds of instances. This means that it's really up to Riot to cherry pick which ones they want to do. And since in this video I am only going to mention 7 of these, it is highly likely I am not going to mention the one that you would like to see. But if you feel strong about your own idea about a dungeon, feel free to comment about it below. This is all valuable feedback for the developers after all. Anyway, the seven raids I picked are based on one simple fact. Their stories and setting are perfectly fit for a raid environment. Be it because their stories are set up for a grand finale, or because some of these villains already have a cast of supporting bosses for the raid. Or simply because the battles would be really cool. And because showing is better than telling, let's start with the first raid. 
One with such a good setup, the raid essentially writes itself. The Ascension of Mount Dargon. As you may remember, Mount Dargon was created by the Celestial God to serve as a gateway to the Celestial Realms. And people decide to climb this place for a variety of reasons. Even though only about 1 in 10,000 makes it to the peak, some people try to climb the mountain because they want to be deemed worthy and become a Celestial Demigod, while, for example, the Masians send their criminals here to die trying to climb the mountain. <laughs> what this the heck? death sentence is called the Crown of Stone. And yes, of course, you can't really force what if they actually the criminals succeed? to climb the mountain unless you go there with them. So most criminals just flee and start a new life elsewhere. Also, oh. at the peak of the mountain, we That's can find fun. Aurelian Soul, the Starforger. The reason why he is here is because of the crown he is wearing. Long story short, thousands of years ago, when people noticed that Aurelian was crossing the stars, they started worshipping him, which boosted Aurelian's ego. And they crafted him a crown of celestial star metal. Aurelian, already being quite egoistic, donned the crown. Only to realize it was a mind-controlling device. Oh, In reality, shit. it was the celestial aspects who wanted to hold Aurelian's power the entire time. Now, to be fair, the aspects are using Aurelian's powers for good cause. They are using okay. his celestial fire to purge the void Man, that from guy is huge. But still, it is the celestial aspects who enslaved Aurelian. This reminds me of the boss in uh, Odum. Is it Odum or Oduar? I keep getting that two mixed up. Oduar. Oduar. Anyway, Riot can make up a billion reasons why we should raid this place. Though I doubt we would be able to fight Aurelian soul at the very peak. You know, he is made out of space. But maybe we need to reach the peak to borrow some of his powers. Or maybe we need to kill a rampant aspect. Or maybe we just need to reach the celestial realm for another reason. Simply said, it is easy to I make feel like this could be in the future future. I don't think we'll find gods from the start. ...reason for this raid to exist. What's more yeah. interesting is the setting of this raid. At different levels, the mountain presents you with different enemies. So let's start with what would happen once you enter the raid. You start at the bottom of the mountain, where you are very likely to meet Chip. Chip is an already established character <laughs> who shows newcomers the wonders of the mountain. So you follow him around until we arrive at our first boss, the living mountain itself. Holy. This place has plenty of earth elementals who came alive due to the mountain. That's magic. a big boy. Now, as I say this, don't confuse the earth elementals with Malphite. Malphite comes from Ishtal, Malphite's is that big? Away from Targon. Also, he's a good guy, we don't want to fight him. But Holy from moly. The Earth Elementals who would likely protect this place. We have, for example, the Blue Sentinel, who also appears in League of Legends. But the biggest of them all is the Stonebreaker. This one would be an excellent introductory uh, boss. You know, you're too... fighting the he's mountain humongous. itself. And yes, I know he's a bit too big, but you can shrink him for gameplay purposes. No, I want wow. him that big, and I want to like smack his like little toenail, and we're like tiny little bacteria like attacking his toenail, dude. And we we like chip it, and then we go back on his back, and then there's like more rock people that shows up in his back. It could be a whole crazy scenario, you know what I mean? Oh, has been notoriously known for inconsistent boss sizes, and it's fine. Anyway, after Stonebreaker, we go further up the mountain. And oh, suddenly, hi. we start meeting all the lesser dragons and their worshippers. The coolest of these are the white flame dragons. There is also an important dragon who serves as a beacon to the other dragons called Inveilus Vox. But the one that could likely become a boss would be the Eclipse Dragon. That's because this dragon is quite precious to the natives on the mountain. Which would be boss number three. You see, further up the mountain, we start encountering the tribes. There are the Lunari who hide in the shadows because they are being suppressed and they are relatively friendly, just like the Rakor. But the Solari are fanatics who blindly protect the celestial realms at any cost. Even in the cinematic, you can see how they are protecting the gateway that is leading to the peak of the mountain. And even though it would be cool if Riot allowed us to fight Leona herself, Champions in League of Legends tend to wear pretty thick plot armor. 
So instead, it would be cool if we could fight one of Leona's champions. The one known as Daylight Spear, Ravoon. He looks anyway, like a Jigga Chad. Anyway, after the Solari protecting the gateway, we would get near the peak. The first one to meet us here would be the Infinite Mind Splitter. This is a legendary draconic creature with a very unique ability. It is told that its gaze gives you so much knowledge and insight that your mind crumbles beneath it. So fighting this boss would be all about getting buffs from it, while being careful not to get too many buffs because it would kill you. Okay. And then, after getting past the infinite mind splitter, we would arrive at the last stand. I can't wait to see what type of uh, mechanic style they go with. FF, WoW, Lost Ark. They got a lot to like yoink from, right? I I hope it's really fun mechanics. I did enjoy Lost Ark mechanic the most though. The mountain, the arbiter of the peak, the last guardian standing in the center of the peak. Yeah, Lost Ark boss mechanics were super fun. Realms. This is the creature that leads the mortals who survive the climb directly to the Celestials. In fact, that's what you can see here. He is guiding... Uh, I think they said they're using real action combat, right? What do you mean real action combat? I feel like that's kind of big, no? Riot has such an advantage in making animal in 2022. Yeah, they can just pick and choose from all the mistakes and goods. LA homework? Yeah, hopefully there's no crazy homework. But in a game, it's good to have a few homeworks that keeps you, like, you know, on the game, of course. Send me a lost arc <laughs> uh, Like, no tab targeting, etc. Oh, no tab targeting. Wait. I like that already, then. Holy moly. Because in WoW, especially in PvP, just tab target and just hit and shoot everything it lands on. There's like no skill shot at all. I did say earlier that like I want to see a lot of skill shots. Kind of like Lee Sin, you know how he shoots his Q and if you hit him, you can teleport to him. I want that type of stuff instead of just click one button, you're already there. Like rewarding gameplay. Are the Traveler to the Celestial Realms where they would become the Traveler. But also, in case of emergency, the Arbiter serves as a guardian. I would say BDO does have the best character creation. Two things could happen They're insane. Here. Either we fight the Arbiter to get its approval to pass into the Celestial Heavens. In this case, perhaps the Arbiter can test us with the lesser Celestial beings. Or we simply have to destroy the Arbiter. In this case, the Arbiter would probably fight us with the Golems. And finally, perhaps after beating the Arbiter, we are granted access to the Celestial Realms. And while, again, I doubt we would be able to fight Aurelian Soul, perhaps we could fight one of his creations that is endangering the world. We have two of them that stand out. The first creation is simply known as the Great Beyond. Aurelian Soul himself calls it his magnum opus. This is essentially a smaller celestial dragon created in Aurelian's image. So this would be like fighting Aurelian himself. Uh, this is, I feel like this is manga. They shouldn't start with this raid. I think this is... This would make sense. Kind of insane. The one I believe this is too might insane. be a bit more appreciated, however, would be the one known as the Scourge. This is also a celestial being created by. Or maybe it's good to hit tackle hard stuff. League of stuff. Legends players might recognize this one as the pure celestial version of Baron Nasher. It is believed Baron. that the physical Baron Monk. was born out of. Oh, the Baron pure should be a boss for so, sure. So the Scourge being the final boss would be a really cool nod towards the League of Legends community. See what I mean? I just made up a seven boss raid in a heartbeat. And I skipped a lot of details just so this video wouldn't be too long. Exactly, there definitely. There are the celestial beasts, the demons trying to consume the heavens, the dragon roost near the peak where dragons are born, the star hounds, Esmus, the breath of the world, and so on. Designing this raid was simple because the lore and the setup is already there. I love this raid, but I think this raid should be like way later. I don't want to start out and our first raid is like fighting galaxy monsters i think that's way too early once again i did not make anything up all of this already exists in the universe and runeterra has yeah i don't want to fight gods right off the bat just like this one it should so, be like later later let's have a look at raid number two 
the one raid I know as a fact people would love to see is a Darkin raid. You can pull this off in a lot of different ways, but since the go roots with this. of the Darkin lore are in Shurima, the raid would most likely be in the deserts. Super quickly, in case you forgot, the Shreeman Empire rose to power after it started using the Sun Disk to reflect celestial magic into their soldiers and turning them into the God Warriors known as the Ascended. Renekton. The Ascended were guaranteed immortality, however their minds were as fragile as they were before. After these Ascended fought the maddening Void Beasts released by their Holy. neighbors, they started going a little bit mad. But their minds finally snapped when their emperor died too and there was no one to give them directions. The story goes that a Darkin known as Zolani, who used to be a great healer, invented blood magic and used it to heal the other Darkin, by which she also infused them with the blood magic, with a secret plan to use the blood magic later to control them all. This was Zolani's secret plan to stop the rampaging Darkin. Unfortunately, the Celestials noticed that the Darkin were very dangerous, and they started sealing them inside special weapons. The sad part is, Zolani herself was also sealed inside her blades. So since Zolani was sealed away, there was nobody to control the others. And as a nice bonus, the remaining Darkin were now empowered with blood magic. Fortunately, in the end, the Celestials sealed all the remaining Darkin inside their weapons too. But stupidly enough, the Celestials let mortals to safeguard these Darkin weapons. So of course, some people were tempted to pick up the weapons and use them for their wars. At which point, the Darkin immediately dominated the minds and bodies of those who picked them up. So yes, these rampaging god warriors managed to free themselves. The cross one, huh? So now, let's quickly go through those who would serve as big raid bosses. Perhaps the most famous one, and as far as we know, the most powerful one, is Aatrox. After Aatrox was sealed away, his blade was picked up by a random warrior in the north. Of course, Aatrox immediately dominated the warrior's body, and since then he's been using blood magic to drain the dead around him, and make himself bigger. That's what you can see in his old cinematic. He starts small, but gets bigger the more- I didn't more even know there was a cinematic of him. In fact, it got to such a point where Aatrox became the only being to ever kill a celestial Oh, that's why he's huge! As I mentioned okay. in the last video, in the art, Aatrox everyone's like tiny. someone wielding the power of the aspect of war so hard. I've seen this image like 10 times now, man. We watched like three of his video. That- Freaking picture of him stabbing keeps coming up, man. And this guy did. Aspect of war was wiped from the stars. <laughs> oh, so out of all he's the He's running out of pictures, Aatrox man. is the ultimate end boss. Besides Aatrox, as mentioned, the second most important Darkin is Zolani. Now, wow, Zolani... Yo, Savix. Missed your B-Day stream. Happy birthday, man. Thank you, man. Can we get back? Rip shirt now. No, we are not bringing rip shirt. Thank you so much to the four month appreciate Daiwa. Yeah, we're just listening to some uh, Riot Games future MMO bosses and raid ideas. He has canonically not returned yet. I could try and Legends some, of Ontera is teasing that she might come back in the future. Also, as a fun fact, in the most recent cinematic, you can see that Talia and Kaisa arrive in front of the faceless statue of Zolani. Next, there is also Varus, a Darkin who was sealed inside a bow, inside a well. And he got freed after two hunters fell into the well. So now, Varus' body is actually occupied by three souls. Oh, I had no idea. And the Darkin. One could say he's the embodiment of two and a half men. And there is also hey, Gabe, yo. the one holding the scythe of a Darkin known as Rast. But as far as we know, Kane is pretty good at resisting Rast's power. So I doubt Rast would be freed. Also, Kane is a League of Legends champion. So in order for Rast to come out, Kane would need to die. And I don't think that's possible with all the plot armor. But we are still not done yet. Next, from the lesser known Darkin, there is also Horazi, 
who was sealed inside a small emblem, Naganeka of Zurita, who was sealed inside a giant ballista. As you can see, she looks... Now, I must say, League, holy moly, they have just spread their lore so much. It's actually really cool to see, because I didn't know any of these. Since I only played till season 3 of League. With like a chicken, and that's because it is believed that a chicken they have gone in the depth, and dude. The that is insane. The chicken's body. And lastly, there is Tarosh, who I was sealed out. inside a massive halberd. The reason why this Darkin raid would work is because all the Darkin have a common goal. They all yeah, hate they're doing Solana. insane work. They see her as a betrayer who was trying to control them. So in this raid, we would likely fight the other Darkin as we are trying to get to Solani. And after we kill her, we would face Aatrox as the final boss. Since all the Darkin Wars began be with Aatrox and Zolani starting a civil war. Also, it turns out that Aatrox was the general of all the other Darkin. So killing Aatrox would be the perfect end to the Darkin chapter. But let's not forget that Riot is already teasing a new Darkin. The next champion in League of Legends might be a dog that picked up a Darkin dagger. Dog. And if you're wondering why we would raid this place, first of all, the Darkin are pretty one-sided bad guys. But we could be led here by Nasus and Sivir. Nasus is an Sivir avoided lost. corruption, so he would be likely happy to put down his former brothers and sisters. And Sivir is holding Holy. the very first blade to be ever used to seal a Darkin. So once again, the lore is already there. And aesthetically, we have a good idea of what it would look like too. We would start outside around the temples of Zolani, which look creepy and corrupted. And later we delve beneath them to where the land is tainted by blood and death. For the next raid, let's stay in Shurima. Because if there is a raid I would personally love to see, it is the raid on Nerimazeth, a city that is in ruins. That's because Nerimazeth was the place where Shurimans tried to build the very first sun disk. This first version failed and instead of the Ascended it was only producing the Bakai, which are broken twisted versions of the glorious Ascended. And in the end the entire city collapsed onto itself. After that, the Shurimans tried to build the sun disk again, but this time in the middle of the desert. But now, why would we want to raid these ruins? Well, that's because... <laughs> this... Dude, this one's a long one. I feel like I'm in history class learning about... <laughs> city is being rebuilt by Zeroth, the <laughs> most powerful arcane mage on Zeroth. <laughs> whose body was turned into pure <laughs> arcane energy by the sun disk itself. Chad, once we play right games, we're gonna know all the lore, okay? Long story. Wow. Before, when Emperor Azir was a child, he became friends with a nameless slave. And despite slaves we're being doing a study group right now. names, he called him Zerath. Throughout the years, the two became oh, I know as both of them. brothers, studying culture and history whenever possible. Later on, despite his father hating him, Azir became his only surviving son. So unless his mother gave birth to another child, he would become the emperor anyway. Well, in secret, Zerath simply made sure she would not give birth to another child. Usually he did it by corrupting the infant in her womb. Because it hey, turns yo. out, this entire time, Zerath was trying to break his roots from slavery. And now he had the ambition to gain power himself. So he justified these murders by telling himself that he was protecting a friend. Despite his efforts, the queen did give birth to another child. So Zerath summoned a storm and let lightning kill the queen and the child. Eventually, all these events led to Azir becoming the crowned emperor of Shurima with Zerath by his side. From this point on, Zerath was waiting for Azir to finally get rid of slavery which never happened. Despite Azir being the most beloved emperor in history, he allowed slavery to keep going on. And that angered Zerath. At the end of the story... The is that his leg? Sorry, I know this is like off, but the opacity on this uh, looks off from his body. I'm wondering if he just slapped on this leg from someone else. It doesn't look correct, right? 
The emperor was chosen to become an ascended himself. Or maybe it but is that. During the ceremony, when the sun disk was focusing its power into Azir's body, it looks Zera a little sussy. was so full of his BS, he Mars. incinerated him Thank and you, forced man. all the power of the sun disk into himself. This oh. resulted in Zerath's body being turned into pure arcane energy, the death of Azir, and the collapse of the sun disk and the destruction of the entire empire. You wanna know the twist at the mm. end? If you read the story from Azir's perspective, you learn that he did want to remove slavery. He oh. just wanted it to be a surprise. In fact, what the fuck? Zerath is an evil person, dude. Announced it just as Zerath betrayed him. Oh. But Zerath already murdered way too many people, so even though he really wanted to stop, it was too late to go back. Pepper so hands. Zerath doomed the entire empire. And yes, because the Emperor died, Mars Zerath again, is man. also technically the reason why the Darkin exists. I already mumbled about the lore for way too long, so just know this. Nasus's brother, Renekton, bound Zerath in a sarcophagus, and he locked himself with Zerath in a tomb. Many years later, scavengers opened the tomb and released Renekton and Zerath. As I said, Zerath is currently in Nerimazeth. And he Good is madhouse. actually trying to rebuild the original sun disk. We don't really know why he is doing it, but I think it's safe to assume that he just wants more power. But you know what it smells like to me? It smells like a big old setup for a future raid. In Legends of Runeterra, you can see a sick boss for sure. Warshippers. You can also see all the mini bosses around him. Especially we know about Demi Yin, the Unbound. But besides all of these heralds and acolytes, this raid would also have the Bakai, the original experimental ascended who come from this city. But also we would fight Renekton himself, because it turns out after hundreds of years of being locked in a tomb with Zerath, Zerath broke his mind by whispering to him that Nasus betrayed him. He purposefully led him to rot in the darkness. Oh, That's shit. why Renekton is quite crazy these days. It all goes back to Zerath. Who might be the Zelda is an evil person? Of you ruined everyone. For the next raid, why don't we play off of the success of Arcane? No spoilers. Arcane? Previously, when I told you about the city spilled over, Shells. I showed you that at the very bottom of that place, you can find the ruins of an ancient Shuriman city. But that will become just a dungeon. The one that would become an interesting raid would be the Empire of <laughs> Renata Glass. After I mention this, I know a lot of you will be confused. After all, Renata Glass is just a rich baron from Zon. How can she support an entire raid? Well, in this case, it is all built on two factors. First of all, Renata is way too big of a character to be removed in just a dungeon. But more importantly, Renata Glask released this year, and she was released as yet another big villain. After all the other already established villains in Piltover and Zone, she simply really feels like a setup for something in the future. Because after already having Singed and Ergot and Victor as villains in this Zone, year? Riot didn't need to make up another. It feels obvious they released Renata to be a villain supervising the other bad guys of Zone. Before her, Zone didn't really have a main villain. So obviously she is now filling that role. Her lore is making her the main boss of Zone. Her raid big. would be very clear in its structure. We would follow the detective case of Caitlyn and Vi as we try to find her hideout. Perhaps Camille, an extremely dangerous assassin from Piltover, would be also interested in killing her. From that point on, we would literally raid her place with the Wardens. As a nice bonus, people would love to see the popular champions Zeri and Echo on our side, both of which are kids from the streets who have destroyed her warehouses before. But the last puzzle piece is, why would we raid Renata? Well, the Glask family owns Glask Industries, which is the most luxurious brand in Piltover and Zone. They sell perfumes and really fancy limb replacements. And perfumes. unfortunately, this brand reflects a bit of real life. Since these fancy formulas are developed down in Zone, using slave labor. But there is also a darker twist. 
all their products are infused with a chemical formula, which can turn their customers into mindless rampaging husks at any moment. Dude, they have infinite like content, Red Train. Now, since Renata is a recent champion... All their champion all is content really for has. the MMO. She is probably the most powerful Baron in Zone, who can make an entire city fall into chaos with the press of a button. She's and that now strong. we're just waiting to see when she would unleash it. If you ask me, I normally wouldn't think that this would be a great raid. But this would be very different from raiding dragons, which would actually give it the benefit of changing environment. But also remember, this is riding off of Arcane's fame. And I doubt Riot would pass on that opportunity. That's why I feel confident we will meet Renata in the MMO. It's a pee break. And now we are diving into the top three raids. I am extremely confident that some form of these will be in the MMO. That's for two reasons. First of all, these big villains are way too big to be ignored. <laughs> we are Still talking about left. characters in the style of Arthas Menethil. Okay. But also, their lore turns them into world-threatening enemies that have to be dealt with. With the first of these being Viego, the Ruined King. There is not a sliver of a doubt we will see the Ruined King in the MMO. You can point a gun to my head, tell me to guess a villain in this MMO, and I will smile knowing that I survive. It would be unimaginable to ignore him. Well, his name now, is Diego? The issue lying in front of me right now is that Viego's story oh, Viego. is massive. On top of the normal story he has in League of Legends, he got his own book that is 400 pages long, the entire RPG game called Ruined King, which is focusing on his reawakening, and League of Legends got its own in-game event that was focusing on pushing his lore forward, which also included three cinematics. Holy. Right now, Viego has the most lore out of any champion he in the He might be the first raid boss. So then. let me summarize it as quickly as possible. Viego was a Camavoran prince who was forced into becoming the king at an early age. Because of this, he was not ready to become a king and many would not consider him a really good king. Still being a teenager, he often threw tantrums in the style of Kylo Ren. To keep the kingdom from crumbling, he relied on his two advisors, Kalista and Nuyo Necrit of Camavor. Yes, that's the character named after me. Eventually, Viego met the love of his life. Is old, a woman whom he loved very, 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 very deeply. He loved her so much that he would do anything for her. Holy. But she didn't abuse it. Isolde was actually a very good queen. For the majority okay. of Diego's ruling, he waved the kingdom's problems away just so he could be with Isolde. Until the day someone tried to poison oh. Viego to finally remove him from the throne, and instead they poisoned Isolde. Uh, that's this her is fault, where man. The dark side really started to show. After trying absolutely everything imaginable, nobody was able to heal his queen, and Viego's angry depression started taking over him. After weeks of desperate searching, Viego found out that there may exist a hidden place called the Blessed Isles which held the sacred blessed waters which could heal anything. And so he sent Kalista away to find Sorry, I'm eyes. grabbing him before he After goes beyond my computer. After a Kalista succeeded and, and breaks confirmed everything. that the blessed waters did indeed exist. So on the next trip, Kalista brought the queen and the king and their soldiers with them, so that they could all heal the queen and be happy ever after. But of course, there was a dark twist. The queen died before they arrived on the Isles. And the priests confirmed Smoke. that they can heal anything as long as the person is alive. But that didn't stop Viego from trying. So after the priests denied him entrance to the waters, Viego massacred everyone who stood in his way and following a creepy warden called Thresh, he arrived at the waters Thresh? and dunked the queen in. For a moment, the waters did resurrect the queen. But then she was turned into a wraith, oh. who killed Viego with his own blade, which caused his soul to be absorbed by the blade. I'm skipping a lot of details here, so just know that yes, the blade can absorb souls. We'll actually talk about the blade in the next MMO video, whenever that one comes out. 
Anyway, after Viego was killed with his own blade, everything exploded in necromantic magic. His queen's soul was shattered into fragments and the entire place was turned into the Shadow Isles. For a thousand years, Viego's soul stayed there in the blade. Until the pirate king Gangplank was told by Thresh that he could totally pick up the blade. His mind was totally strong enough to resist the power of the king. Spoiler Wait, does Gangplank die? Wasn't. And the moment Gangplank picked up the blade, his mind and body was dominated by Viego, who then used that body to fully release himself back into the world. After that, even though everyone's been dead for a thousand years, Viego still wanted to bring his wife back. Holy. And so he started to unleash the undead with the black mist all around the world in an attempt to find all the fragments of his queen's soul. Eventually, he succeeded and he actually managed to bring oh. the queen's soul back. But immediately after that, he was defeated by the Sentinels of Light. Oh, that's Remember fucked up, bro! What? Damn, he's a good husband, chat. The hunting class from the last video? That's them. And not only did they permanently destroy the queen's soul, because the queen didn't actually want to be resurrected, but Viego's entire story arc Holy. ended with him being teleported back to his homeland called Camavor, where he oh, was he banished until the dude. present days. You can actually see the end of the storyline in the cinematic called Absolution. And this is why Viego is going to be an incredible boss in the MMO. He does have a lot of story behind him. But more importantly, this entire time we have only seen his young, reckless personality, where he acts like a child throwing tantrums. As he's constantly trying to help someone he is obsessively in love with. But the thing is, his entire life he was chasing his queen. He was ready to go beyond <laughs> death just to be with her. He was but chasing now his queen. He was imprisoned after learning that the queen didn't want to be with him, but also after her soul was permanently destroyed. So once Viego is unleashed from his prison again, instead of a cocky teenager, we are going to have a pissed oh, off king who has lost. nothing. He to does look like that. And that transformation into the Dark King is something I really want to see. And you can only imagine what the raid is going to look like. Hordes of risen Camavoran soldiers, ancient undead dragons brought from his homeland, the legendary Rasa the Sunderer, and even more legendary Hecarim of the Iron oh. Order. But there is also Commander Ledros. Or maybe Karthus, the Death Singer. And finally Thresh, the one who caused all of this to happen. The hidden master of puppets in the shadows. Simply said, Viego has a lot of meaningful enemies serving him. And the raid. I think this should be one of the be. earlier raids. This will be good. Side note in the distant future, I kind of want to cover the entire story of Viego. Wish me luck. For the next raid, we are not delving too far away from the undead theme. Well, you can buy the item in League, really? Holy. Because it's time to cover the most brutal badass warrior this universe had ever seen. Super quickly, just for clarity. Viego's deathly magic is really undeath in its true meaning. When he's turning his enemies into undead souls, oh, I know it's the more sword. like he I is preventing them from dying and he's turning them into somewhat living wraiths instead. So he's not really the master of death. As you'll see, that title goes to Mordekaiser. His story begins as a warlord known as San Uzal. During his wow. time... Oh, hey. Thank you for the two months, appreciate it, man. Thank you, thank you. ...continents were occupied by barbaric tribes. San Uzal believed that by killing as many people as possible, he would please the gods of the afterlife. And so, he forged an empire in blood and death. As his life was near the end, he took great satisfaction in knowing that he would sit at the gods' tables, in the glorious halls of bones. However, when he died, he found no glory waiting for him. Instead, San Uzal stood in an empty grey wasteland, with an occasional soul drifting by. He watched as these lesser spirits faded into the fog, unmade and lost in time. But San Uzal refused to fade. 
His will, tempered by rage and torment, held him together. In other words, he was simply too angry to die. He started listening to the disembodied whispers around him. And he learned this was Oknun, the language of the dead. Slowly, Oknun. he came up with a plan. He began whispering temptations into the veil between two men to die. power to any who would listen. And sure enough, he managed to tempt a few cultists into bringing him back to life. Lacking any flesh or bone, he told the cultists to bind his spirit to metal plates, forged in the likeliness of his old armor. And so he rose as the revenant of iron and hate. Holy no dude, this League of Legends lore! But rather, in Oknun, he was Mordekaiser. Originally, these cultists wanted to use Mordekaiser as a weapon in their trivial wars. But instead, Mordekaiser killed them all, and he used their souls to forge himself a brutal oh, mace shit. called Nightfall. With that, Mordekaiser's second conquest of the world started. But this time, he was wielding necromantic magic. All his enemies were confused because it seemed like Mordekaiser only cared about massacre and destruction. Entire generations perished under his campaign. He's but a jailer? In reality, there was far oh, more to shit. Mordekaiser's real plan. At the center <laughs> of his empire, he raised the Immortal Bastion, which became the largest structure on Runeterra. And he used that place to gather information about spirits and death. Be it by capturing and studying demons, or torturing yordles until he could harvest their secrets. He did everything in his power what? to Torture understand yordles. the realms beyond. Nonsense has Eventually, the video for you. Mordekaiser became such a tyrant, the entire continent banded against him. But when he was ultimately defeated, it was not because of his enemies. But rather, he was betrayed from his inner circle. The immortal Bastion had a secret cabal led by a witch we know as Leblanc. They managed to separate Mordekaiser's spirit from his armor and seal the empty armor in a hidden place. As a result, without his physical vessel, Mordekaiser was forced out of the physical realm. What none of the cultists knew, however, is that all of this was according to Mordekaiser's plan. The entire time he was forging a destiny greater than the Halls of Bones. When he finally returned to the empty wasteland of the afterlife, he was met by the not. hundreds of thousands who died under his reign. Prevented by his dark magic, they would never fade. They would be his eternal army bound to his will. But even the weakest of the spirits were given purpose. Just like he used the souls of the cultists to forge his maze, the weakest of the souls would become the building blocks of his afterworld. And so what? Mordekaiser became the king of the afterlife. And even though he was cast out, with his physical vessel being banished in the immortal He's bastion massive, in man. Noxus, he is already planning on how to return. And once he does so, after so many people were fed into his realm, he would be so powerful nobody would know how to stop him. Since that is where his story cut off, you know that this is a setup for the future. Even in League of Legends, sometimes Mordekaiser is joked about as a raid boss. Once he starts rolling, you need the entire team to get him down. And Riot would be foolish not to use him as a badass raid boss in the end. He would be a badass raid boss. Especially since we already know some of the other characters that we would see in his raid. When Mordekaiser was conquering the world the second time, he had two demons which he used as his companions. These would be Tybolk, the giant fire demon, and Atakan, an iron-bound shadow demon. To get to him, we would probably have to get past the one who banished him, oh. Leblanc, and I wouldn't be surprised if we also met Vygar, the yordle Mordekaiser tormented to get his yordly secrets. Finally, oh, is that why he's like covered in shadow? Swain. One of the leaders of Noxus who is actively trying to root out the dark magics from Noxus. So yeah, maybe Mordekaiser's story is not as long as Viego's, but Mordekaiser is built on... I think it's still so crazy that, like, one champion has this much lore. Conquest. And you said there was a game of it, Namsen? His story is simply badass. And you bet, that's what people want to fight.
And this takes us to the last raid I want to show you. Not only is this raid inevitable, but it is going to be the final raid before Riot starts to get sweaty about their future. Because from that point on they would be forced into making up new enemies. <gasps> and that's no. usually when the lore of MMOs crumbles. With the ultimate endgame in Runeterra being the battle against the end of everything. The Watchers of the Void. Now, I know we already quickly summarized the story of the Watchers Wasn't when that we the intro? The world, but we need to quickly do it again because if they get their own raid, it would be a really cool merging of multiple storylines of this universe. Basically, at the beginning of everything, there was nothing. Just dark, empty void. Until there was a spark of light. This spark of light illuminated the darkness and revealed creepy entities we know as the Watchers, who before this event didn't even know about their own existence. Of course, since this first light woke the Watchers up for the first time, since the beginning of time, the Watchers got annoyed and they decided to silence it so they could sleep again. As they drifted closer, we learned that this spark was indeed our reality. So to get rid of the light, the Watchers tried to poke it and taint it. But they were always too big to get through and deal with it themselves. So instead, they okay. reached into reality, stole something, corrupted it and released it back. In hopes that it would destroy the rest of the reality. But even that wasn't too successful. Eventually, the Watchers started whispering into the light. And the Ice Witch known as Lysandra answer. Uh -huh. The Watchers promised her people immortality and great power. In exchange, they asked Lysandra to prepare her world for the coming of the Void. In secret, behind the backs of her two sisters, she agreed. The Watchers empowered the strongest of their followers and turned them into the Iceborne. And soon enough, the Watchers broke into reality. Tazel, thank you for seven months, man. Appreciate it. We're almost done with the history class, gentlemen. Let's go. Let's go. With it, Lysandra's allegiance with the Watchers was undeniable. But as the Watchers rose for the first you, time, you, Lysandra got to see how horrifying they were. And she realized they came here to destroy everything. In desperation, Lysandra sacrificed her sisters and the Iceborne to use their magic to freeze the Watchers beneath the ice. But even that magic wasn't enough. Beneath the ice, the Watchers were only sleeping. They would break out should they try to wake up. So these days, Lysandra is kidnapping the surviving Iceborne. She freezes them in her fortress. She is then using their inherent Dude, we're powers done to now. <laughs> that was the so ice. Many. And she is feeding their dreams to the Watchers <laughs> to keep them asleep. As a bonus, Lysandra is killing anyone who remembers the old days and who could spill out I that play she that actually game, kinda betrayed all humanity. See, this setup on its own is enough to support a raid. Let's say we raid the Frostguard Citadel, which is where Lysandra is keeping the Watchers frozen. I'm gonna be honest, I think this could be one of the first raids, and this should be the last one. The one where you fight like the fucking galaxy monster gods. This doesn't seem that uh, insane as the galaxy gods. This should be one of the first ones. First, we get there by crossing the Holing Abyss. This is the bridge that is incredibly iconic for League of Legends play. Aram, is it Aram chat? Oh, I don't remember, man. I think it's Aram. Did they used to be Dominion as well? The circle map? Holy. This, this is where you play Aram. I bet you never noticed that at the end of the bridge, oh, is it Aram? You can I thought it was Aram. The entrance to the Frostguard Citadel. And in fact, the ghastly shopkeeper is one of the soldiers who remembers the coming of the Watchers. Oh. After getting inside, we would fight Lysandra's frozen trolls. I like These Dominion. These are trolls that Lysandra twisted herself to serve her. But they are also supported by the Harbinger of Trolls. Whatever that is. Then we would fight through Lysandra's army of the Drakworn. These warriors dedicated their lives to Lysandra, knowing that they are protecting the world from the end of everything. Next, we would face the most mysterious creatures of the Freljord. We don't really know what they looked like in their pure form. We only know what they look like after they were corrupted by the Watchers. And these would be the creatures with their very interesting names. 
There is she who wanders. Bro, that thing's massive. Who, and it that stares. Whatever these creatures used to be, now they are titanic. With their eye beam disintegrating reality. What did they then even eat? Then of course eat? we would have to get past Lysandra herself before we arrive at the Frozen Watcher. I think it's likely that we are going to fight one of these. And this would be a sick boss with their arm swinging and everything. And we can like jump over it and shit. Or climb up their arm to like chop it off. That would be sick. What's cool is that even though this is the toughest enemy this universe has to offer. Even That's what you worry about? I mean when I see a big monster I'm like curious. What did they eat you know? How are they going to feed this thing to survive? <laughs> We defeat it, we don't really defeat all the Watchers. That's the clever backdoor of this universe. Yeah. We can't destroy them all. They are the primal force, there is an endless sea of them. If anything, our reality is a parasite in their void. So if we defeat a frozen Watcher, all we really do is plug a hole. But the Watchers continue... Wow, Tyra, thank you to five months. The Tyra from FF, Yo, thank you, thank you, man. Anyway, this Up watcher well. looks strange, doesn't it? It's not really the floating eye that you would imagine. Well, that's because, as it is with all the League of Legends stories, there is a twist. You see, just as the watchers are able to corrupt a being, they are also open to being corrupted themselves. The process always comes from both sides. And so, the more the watchers interact with humans for example, the more human-like they become themselves. And since the Watchers in the Freljord were frozen there for thousands of years... I am very... Dude, I want to applaud this man for recording for one hour standing up. That is insane, dude. Legends of Runeterra shows us that once they would break through, that's what they would look like. They would have many human-like limbs. The story told us they have fur from all the animals. And they even have a creepy fake face. So no, this is not what a pure watcher would look like. This is a DK watcher nice, painted man. by Good the stuff. people of the Freljord. Also, you might be wondering, how do we actually beat the most powerful being in this universe? Well, that's where the stories collide. First of all, Lysandra would be the key to freezing the watchers. She would have to be on our side at the end there. Also, the primal god Orn constructed the bridge leading to the citadel. And this bridge was used as a magical seal to help keep the watchers down there. So Orn himself would help us. What the heck but is most that? importantly, I've never there that. is another massive storyline that is in Shrima centered around a Voidborn known as Belveth. Because okay. this video is already way too long, just yeah. super quickly. How, you know did how did you the record this? themselves got tainted when interacting with reality? Down in Shurima, a small pocket dimension formed between the void and our reality. It was sort of like a cancer growth on the void. In fact, if you dive deeper into this, you may realize that this is directly correlating to real-life cancer. If you don't know, cancer is just living tissue that decided, hey, I don't want to die. And that's exactly what happened here. As the void started consuming people in Shurima, it got tainted by the people and it formed self-awareness. Soon, because this cancerous growth inside the void needed to represent itself, it grew a creature known as Belveth. A voidborn that looks a bit fishy because she consumed a harbor, but also she doesn't actually like the Watchers because the Watchers want to end everything. And all Belveth wants to do is to live. And so these days, Belveth is consuming entire cities at a time. And she is rebuilding everything with the information she got. With her ultimate end goal being to rebuild all I reality. I didn't know that either, So that centimeter. she could be a reality and she would be strong enough to fight the Watchers. Of course, at this time, she doesn't really have all the information gathered. So whenever she is recrafting cities and people, it all looks uncanny. However, at this point, she consumed hundreds that? of thousands of people. And she is using all of their brain power, so Belveth is very smart. Now, the reason why this storyline is important is because Belveth once talked to Kaisa, and she offered her a deal. If mortals help Belveth consume reality faster, she would spare them to be the last she would consume. Belveth said that she did the calculations and she knows that humanity could never beat her. 
But at least, with this deal, she gave them the chance to create a weapon or maybe find a hero who maybe could slay her. Holy dude, what she is their suit, man? Achieve it. But she is willing to give them the chance. And you see, this is where we can get another twist. This wasn't confirmed, this is purely my theory. But I believe that there is a way to destroy Belveth. See, Belveth believes that we can't beat her. But the fact is, she used hundreds of thousands of human brains to figure it out. Oh, but the shit. humans can't even comprehend the power of the Celestials. Thank so you, Chris. I believe Aurelian soul could destroy her. She just doesn't have the brain power to figure that out herself. So what I think is going to happen is that at some point we are going to beat Belveth. She realizes she was wrong. She realizes that humanity is stronger than her when fighting the Watchers. And she decides to help us destroy them. So should we ever get a raid on the Frostguard Citadel? I wouldn't be surprised if before that we got another raid where we delve into Belveth's little pocket dimension. What is saying? I have no idea. Help, we move to the north. Or, you know, we just destroy her. I'm going to be honest. I, ha I have a span attention of like a goldfish. I've only been looking at pictures. Way cooler. So all of that is still just a wild theory. The fact is... <laughs> We are fighting yeah. the Watchers. Uh, the pictures that help a lot, man. Incredible. The pictures help a lot, actually. Holy moly, that's a lot of and bosses, that was man. all the raids I wanted to show you. All of them are supported by the lore, and it is up to Riot Ooh. whether they want to do them or not. Except the last three raids. Those are happening. There is no way around it. But because people are going to freak out, let me give you some honorable mentions. <laughs> I kind of forgot everything at the Demacia right? Yeah, I forgot too. The racist to magic people, man. Universe also technically has the Grim Reaper. While they may have many forms, the most well-known form of death itself <laughs> is Kindred. We wouldn't really have a good reason to fight them though, since death isn't really an evil entity in this universe, but you know, they exist. I would also love to fight against Vladimir's Hemomancers. We could also get a raid on the Ursine with Volibear oh, being what the, the final boss. Volibear is that big? The primal god of wilderness. In the east, there is also Ain't the no mysterious way, bro. demon known as Ashlash. A seven-handed liquid demon that is locked beneath the earth in a place known as the seventh layer. Nila is currently wielding its power and it looks like a setup for the future. Also, there is... Fiddlesticks, the primal and most powerful demon on Runeterra. What the? Dude, that is not the fiddlestick I remember. Fiddlestick old. Bro. <laughs> Wait, how did this guy become that, bro? Yeah, this is the fiddlestick I remember, man. What the? Did he become a Jigga Chad? Fiddlesticks itself is just a puppet. The demon is what you can see inside the cave. The heal is really a sword. Fiddlesticks is roaming around the world. Holy moly, I, I didn't want to bed, raid setting. But you bet we are fighting him at some point. If you want a creepy video to react to, find Fiddlesticks cinematic. Simply said, the lore I have not seen Fiddlesticks so cinematic. Maybe we should watch that. Today. And in the future, I can make a smaller video where I cover the dungeons of this MMA. yeah maybe the smaller the hour if i was not with you guys chat i don't think i would have watched this this is long but this was a very informative great long video nickel of course holy moly now that's it i'm running out of content so let's see um what do we have next but hey, my question why do you hold the lab mic <laughs> wait what do you Oh yeah, he could just pin it. He could literally just pin it on his neck. He's just holding it though. I didn't question him because, you know, I thought it was just for content to hold it. Holy moly. Great video, dude. PPC. Damn. I genuinely cannot express how fitting it is for the man to be the face of the game narrator. I honestly hope Fiddle Sticks will wield much power. Yeah, I definitely think these three will be here. I think this should be the last one, though. The one where they fight, like, the star monster galaxy people. 
Yeah, this should be the last one, if anything. Because this is like outer space god monsters, right? I'll watch the Fatal Six. Sure, I'll watch the Fatal Six. Yeah, also, before we go, do I want to play this? This game looked really fun, man. Or, uh, sorry, I, I haven't even seen it, but all the lore is from here, right? I gotta finish uh, Final Fantasy VII first. Uh, Fatal 6 trailer. You wanna watch 45 minutes? Ruined King Lore? Yeah, Ruined King Lore. No, 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 no. Dude, I think I had enough League of Legends content today, man. I think this is the last one. And I'm gonna go level my Dragon Boy. Here we go, chat. Fatal 6 Terror and Demacia. Dude, I'm in <laughs> three hours! <laughs> I'm not watching three. Are you crazy, man? A full tankard in a warm tavern was the plan. Not extra watch. Whole countryside's on edge after Fuss Barrel. Yeah, filthy mages. <laughs> they show up here. Oh. They show up here, and I'll come. Oh. Cedric. Oh. Hey, Tedrick. Tedrick. Help me! That might be a goosebump. Molko. That was a that was fast. Holy moly! Fiddle sticks. What a trailer, dude! I actually got goosebumps. They did a good job with it, man. Listen to his voice. Sure. I'm always here, my little hero. Dude, he had a glow up. Holy moly! Fiddle stick. Oh, remember the one I showed? How did he go from this chat? Where's the old art? Old art. Dad. Dude, why does this one look so funny? <laughs> oh my god, that one's so bad, dude. Damn, he's actually terrifying now, man. Look at him. Holy moly, dude. Kind of insane. Well, gentlemen, that was a lot of right MMO content. I can't wait. Hopefully, we get more very, very soon. Um, I was planning to play some Dragonflight beta and try out the Dragon class. Would you guys be interested in that? So, search up Surprise Party Fiddlestick. Sure. I need a pee as well, man. Holy, wait, this is the new one? Yeah, this was the old one. I remember this. I think I bought this for my brother for his birthday present or something. Because it looks so lame. Holy, the new one looks crazy, dude. League always did really good with their arts. Bro, this one's another 50 hour, dude. No, no, no. Legendary loot, all right? Dude, this guy is farming. This guy is a farming, dude. He... I'm not gonna watch it, but dude, his content is like everything. <laughs> He's taking a loot, dude. A loot video. Uh, world skin TFT monsters. How Riot scrapped the universe. League of Red Con. Legendary loot for Riot's MMO, according to the lore. Bro, I'm not watching loot. Are you crazy? You know what I want to do, though? What game would help me improve to play the League of Legends MMO? Because it's not tab target, like, wow. Should I be practicing FPS? If it's skill shot it. Not DDO. Minesweeper. 
League of Legend. I don't know, man. What what should we be practicing, chat? Damn, Ryan's got a lot of lore though. That's crazy. I did not know that. Oh, he's been doing stand-up talk for a while now. Champions who can abotically banged. Valorant, New World, Roblox. I guess New World, yeah. It won't come up for a year, you don't have to worry. No no no, that's why we should we should be practicing. So that when it comes out, we're comfortable with the <laughs> I might play like aim trainer or something, dude. 